next injury we're going to look at is lateral luxation. This is when the tooth is displaced in any direction except axially. An axial displacement would indicate uh, an intrusion or an extrusion. Since in a lateral luxation, the tooth is displaced in any direction except axially, it will also cause a fracture of the labial or palatal alveolar bone. If both the labial and palatal alveolar bone are fractured, the injury should be classified as an alveolar fracture. Honestly, it could be difficult to know for sure if the labial and palatal alveolar bone are fractured. And the treatment for a lateral luxation and alveolar fracture is the same, basically. So if the diagnosis is questionable, it really doesn't make a huge difference. One difference between a lateral luxation and an alveolar fracture that could help is an alveolar fracture rarely would only involve one tooth. Typically, you're going to see several teeth involved or displaced in that type of injury. A lateral luxation is characterized by partial or total separation of the PDL. With a lateral luxation, the tooth will frequently be non-mobile. What often happens is the tooth is moved laterally and it gets locked in a position within the alveolar bone. And this will result in the percussion of the tooth yielding a high metallic or ankylose sound. As always, pulp test the teeth, uh, expect the teeth to respond negative to cold, and with this injury, there will uh, be a higher likelihood of pulpal necrosis. In case you haven't noticed a trend yet, the radiographs for this injury will be an occlusal and two periapical exposures from the mesial and distal. Expect to see a space around the root of the tooth that represents the socket of where the tooth was located. The goal of the treatment is to reposition the tooth and to splint. For full treatment directions, refer to the trauma guide. Repositioning a lateral luxation can be a little tricky if you have not done it before. Because the tooth has locked itself into the alveolar bone, you need to try and push the tooth down and back to where it belongs at the same time. Once you think you have the tooth back in its original position, you will want to confirm this position with a radiograph. Apply a flexible splint for up to four weeks as part of the treatment. In a way similar to intrusion, the likelihood of inflammatory root resorption is high, so it is important to monitor the pulpal status. If the tooth is immature, revascularization can be confirmed radiographically by continued root formation. This could be confirmed with a positive response to cold tests uh, post-injury as well. A tooth that is immature has a higher chance of maintaining vitality. If the tooth is fully formed, continue to monitor the pulp for up to three months. If the pulp has not responded within the first three months, root canal therapy should be initiated. Follow-up should be at two weeks and at four weeks for splint removal. Continue follow-up at six to eight weeks and at one year. If normal pulp responses are found at all these follow-up visits, no further treatment is indicated.